The uh, session we're about to have is uh, really through the incredible work of many people, but one in particular, John Gorham. I, I, I did not know John before all of this, but I soon found he's a force to be reckoned with. He, uh, through willpower and arm twisting, uh, got the committee to realize that climate change, much as our classmates had indicated in the survey, is something very important and that ought to be dealt with, not just once in this session, in this uh, reunion, not just twice, but at least three times, if not more. And John is to be commended. He's had a four-decade career in green tech. He founded or co-founded over a dozen organizations that have jump-started new industries. He's been honored as in Connecticut, the Governor's Connecticut Climate Change Leadership for his grassroots local sustainability work. He co-founded a 57-acre organic farm and community-supported agriculture project in Woodbridge, Connecticut. And over the past year, he has been working uh, uh, incredibly hard with the fall in the fall for the symposium on climate change, highlighted the work of classmates involving climate change activities. He's been a lead organizer of our climate change events at this reunion. Uh, John, over to you. It's nice to see so many friends out there. I can't see any of you, but thanks for coming to this first of three sessions on climate change. And thank you, George, for your kind words. It's a distinct honor and privilege for me to introduce two of my environmental heroes, Bill McKibben and Mary Evelyn Tucker. But before I introduce them, uh, let me explain the plan for this session. In the next 40 minutes, Mary Evelyn and Bill will engage in a conversation on the topic of the climate emergency. While they are speaking, runners will be collecting questions that you have written on these index cards. Everybody, put up your hand if you would like an index card so that you can write a question. Uh, we'll, um, I will call them for the final minutes, uh, 30 minutes of uh, Q&A. We will break right before 4 p.m. so that you can all walk over to the Harvard Science Center to attend the 415 sessions that will be held. You know where the Science Center is? Just catty corner. Uh, let, let me introduce Bill first. Bill is a uh, HR graduate, class of 1982. He cut his teeth in journalism as the editor and president of the Harvard Crimson and has gone on to an illustrious career in academia, serving as the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College and as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Bill has published over a dozen books and has written for a host of publications like The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Rolling Stone, just to name a few. Bill has honorary degrees from 19 college and, colleges and university and has many books on environmental topics that have been translated into over 20 languages. Bill helped found 350.org, the first global grassroots climate campaign. That organization spawned the divest fossil fuel movement, which has grown from 181 institutions with $52 billion pledged in 2014 to 1,485 institutions with $39 trillion pledged. Uh, more recently, Bill has founded Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 to work on defending the planet's climate and the nation's democracy. Bill informed me recently, just momentarily, as minutes ago, that he'll be happy to welcome septuagenarians, like old codgers like ourselves. Uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, a dear friend, um, today uh, she will be engaging Bill in conversation. Uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker also is a world-renowned author, scholar, and environmentalist. Mary Evelyn is the producer and co-author of the Emmy Award-winning movie, Journey of the Universe. She is also the co-founder with her husband, John Grimm, who is here, of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. Together, they have produced online courses on Yale Coursera, 
three for Journey of the Universe, and six for Religion and Ecology. Since 1997, Mary Evelyn has been a research associate at the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies at Harvard, and her concern for the growing environmental crisis, especially in Asia, led her to organize with her husband a series of 10 conferences on world religions and ecology at the Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions, 1995 to 1998. Uh, they were the first series editors for the 10 volumes that Harvard published, published for these conferences. Mary Evelyn and John studied with Thomas Berry and worked closely with him, editing his books and writing his biography. In June 2019, she and John received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Religion, Nature, and Culture. With that, let me turn it over to Mary Evelyn and Bill. What a joy to see you today. And I br bring greetings from Yale. And I hope that we'll be united in divestment issues and other things that will come up uh, today. But it's a great privilege to be here with Bill. Uh, it was more than 20 years ago when we had a conference at the American Academy of Religion, um, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, on religion and ecology. And that's a Daedalus volume now. And Bill. Uh, gave a rousing concluding essay for uh, that collection of essays saying it's time to act. And that's what we're here to talk about. Clearly, we know we're in this extraordinary moment, the most challenging moment in world history, we could say, uh, and one in which weather around the world is telling us it's time to change. And I want to just elevate the notion this isn't just climate change. It's a climate emergency. And the EU Parliament has voted that this is a climate emergency. The UK Parliament has voted in that direction, Irish Parliament and others. On our website, we identify it as a climate emergency. So here in the US, we hope that that level of urgency and action and hope and possibility will be something that we'll be discussing here today. We've got heat waves, as we had two weeks ago on the East Coast. We've got a thousand-year drought in the Southwest. We have fires in the Southwest and across California, as you know. The largest heat waves ever in India uh, the last several months. So it's a problem here, it's a problem around the world, and as we know, the poor and those without resources are going to be some of those who are already suffering the most. We have over 100 million refugees from climate. Climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, is plaguing our youth. So, with that cheerful introduction, uh, I want to give us over to some discussion here, but beginning with Bill, who's been truly a founder and one of the most eloquent spokesperson for this issue beginning in 89 with his book, End of Nature, writing in The New Yorker and so on. So I want to invite him, who keeps in better touch than anyone, on the pulse of this issue here in this country and around the planet. And I know he has some good news to share with us. Maybe he'd like to begin with that. Um, and then what are the key issues on climate emergency? Well, first of all, Mary Evelyn, what a pleasure to be with you and what a pleasure to be with you all you know, when I was here at Harvard, all I did for four years was work at the Crimson all the time. And um, we'd go back and look at the old bound volumes from a few years before, and it was always go back to look at the ones from 69 and 70 and 71 because there was so much going on. Clearly, you guys are the class that barely went to school in the first place. And... and and now you're the class that can, can barely have a reunion, um, sort of either sort of orphaned and abandoned or the, the kind of velveteen rabbit of classes. But it's very, very good to get to be with you all. Um, um, look, 
let's just think about, let's just think about 1970 for a minute. Um, and the first Earth Day, which was a big deal in Cambridge as it was many other places, probably the biggest demonstration in the history of the country, 20 million people in the streets, and effective. Within a year, uh, the public opinion was so undeniable that even Richard Nixon, who cared not a whit about the environment, was forced to sign the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. And what do you know? The air got cleaner and the water got cleaner and I think it was very hard in 1971 to imagine that that curve wasn't going to continue in a good direction. Um, and that instead we would end up uh, uh, by your 50th reunion in a place where the poles were melting, the ocean was rising, and the environmental problems of the 1960s look almost minuscule by comparison. Um, I did write the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect in 1989. And the sad thing is that we knew everything really that we know now in 1989. We knew that when you burned coal and gas and oil, you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we knew its molecular structure trapped heat. Um, and the only thing we didn't know precisely was how fast this was going to happen and how hard it was going to pinch. Suffice it to say, it's happened very fast and it's pinching very hard. This is by far the largest thing that human beings have ever done, by orders of magnitude, the largest thing that human beings have ever done. And, and at the moment, things are going very badly. The temperature is up so far, uh, about 1.2 degrees Celsius, about 2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's been enough to melt most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic. Oh, since warm air holds more water vapor than cold, we see this rapidly increased evaporation in arid areas. Once you turn the temperature up, it inevitably leads to forest fires, which we're seeing on a scale that we've never seen before. Um, um, once that water vapor is up in the air, it's going to come down. And that's why we see storms like we've never seen before. I was in New York City last August when the remnants of Hurricane Ida came through, and lots of people drowned in their basement apartments in the greatest rainstorm ever measured in, in New York City. Um, so that's the bad news, and to get it out of the way, the worst news is that we're still fairly near the beginning of that curve. We've raised the temperature just over one degree Celsius so far, but we're on the way to raise it three degrees Celsius, before the current Harvard class is back for their 50th. And if we do that, they won't be back for their 50th. If we raise the temperature like that, we will not have civilizations quite like the ones we're used to. The rate of violent flux and chaos resulting is just too much. The UN has estimated that that, that would produce a billion or more climate refugees. Four million people have left the Ukraine, and that strained the ability of the richest parts of the world to absorb refugees. Multiply that by 250 and try to imagine what happens, okay? So that's the tough stuff out of the way. Let me give you the somewhat better news, which is that we also now know what we need to do about this. Uh, the world scientists and engineers have done a terrific job especially over the last decade, in knocking down the price of renewable energy to the point where energy from the sun and the wind and the batteries to store them is now the cheapest power on the planet. I, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker earlier this year saying, given all this, it's actually quite plausible to imagine that the 200,000 year human career of setting stuff on fire could come to an end very, very quickly. Setting stuff on fire has served us well, but it no longer is. And now we're able to rely on the fact that the good Lord placed a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away in the sky, and we know how to use it to do what needs doing. An example of that, and this is this little piece of good news that just came in. Um, uh, I, one of the... Um, kind of ancillary miracle technologies to that is this little item called the heat pump uh, that replaces the furnace in your basement and it uses the ambient heat in the air outside to heat and cool your home. 
And when the war in Ukraine broke out, I'd written a series of pieces advocating that the president use the Defense Production Act to mandate the rapid in, you know, uh, production and installation of as many of these devices as possible. He pumps for peace and freedom, I called it. And about an hour ago, the president indeed invoked the Defense Production Act, and we're going to start doing it. So um, um, that's, that is a small piece of good news, but it doesn't obviate the fact that in the larger sense, we're way behind the curve. And here's the thing to bear in mind. We have to not just solve this problem, we have to solve it fast. It's not like other political problems. We haven't solved, I mean, people were talking about national health care when you were in college, and we haven't gotten around to solving that yet, and I think that's great sadness because a lot of people have died or gone bankrupt, but when we finally do get around to doing what every other country in the industrialized world has done, it won't have made it impossible in the meantime to do the right thing. Climate change isn't like that. Once the Arctic's melted, it's not like someone has a plan for how you freeze it back up again. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, our experts here, have given us until 2030 to cut emissions in half. That is a huge task at the bleeding edge of the technically possible, even if we focused entirely. And we're not focused entirely, and the reason we're not is because despite the fact that we have the largest problem on Earth and a reasonable set of solutions for beginning to address it, we have in the middle this combination of inertia and especially toxic vested interest that's kept us from going anywhere. And the absolute perfect example of it is something that your classmate, Senator Schumer, has been dealing with for the last, now he's managed to get, by whatever count, 48 or so, U.S. senators lined up willing to actually take the first effective action that Congress would have taken on climate change in this Build Back Better bill. But 48 votes doesn't get you very far in the U.S. Senate. Um, and the, the 50th key vote belongs, as everyone knows, to the senator from West Virginia, who's so far blocked all serious effort on climate change and has taken more money from the fossil fuel industry than anyone else in Washington. Not an easy title to win, but he's won it. And what a staggering return on investment the Exxons of the world are getting for their money, you know? So overcoming that gridlock caused by the fossil fuel industry, which has been there for 35 years as they have systematically lied about this and lobbied in every way to prevent action on it, has been the reason that we've had to build huge movements. I did not and have you know, come out of Harvard thinking that I would end up in jail over and over again, nor do I think that that's actually what one should have to do to get the world to pay attention to clear warnings from scientists about what we need to do. But it turns out that that's precisely what people have needed to do, that and a million other things like it, to build movements big enough to try and force some change that's where we are now. We're closer, but we're not close enough. And, and if we do not get close enough with, I mean, look, none of us are, are young, but almost all of us are going to live long enough to see the outcome of this story. Because the end of this decade is the crucial period of time as the science, climate scientists have made abundantly clear. That was a 10 minute wrap, right? <laughs> that we all have to wrap our heads around. And it's wonderful that it's being recorded so we can share it that way. I want to also extend the notion that the climate emergency, while absolutely primary, the United Nations considers our ecological crises as multiple. And I just want to draw that into our consciousness and so on. And why is that? They're saying it's climate emergency, which the UN Secretary General says is red alert as we've just heard, but it's also biodiversity loss. We are in a sixth extinction period. Uh, in 1998, the Hall of Biodiversity was built at the Natural History Museum in New York. You can see on the floor, we are in the midst of a sixth extinction period. This is not debatable. And it also says we have the possibility of reversing the tide of destruction because healthy ecosystems require, of course, changing climate action, but also the life systems. They are at stake. They are at risk. 
We don't need to go into all the statistics right now, but those of you who have children, the appeal for your grandchildren, the animal world, the fish world, the reptile world, etc. This is also what is disappearing before our eyes. And the other third problem that the United Nations brings forward and sometimes gets lost um, is pollution. Now, we know there's toxicities in our water, our air, our soil. What is healthy food? What is going to be healthy, not just for humans, but for all life on the planet? Are we going to have more Flint, Michigans? There are so many Flint, Michigans across this country, and they still don't have decent water. Newark, and we can name Cancer Alley in Louisiana, where African-American communities are suffering immensely from the pollution of the oil and gas industry. And my husband, who studies Native American traditions, we've been on many, many reservations in this country. And the conditions are horrendous. Conditions where in the Southwest, there's not even enough water for well over 60% of the community. It has to be delivered. We can go on and on. And again, I'm emphasizing this is people and planet, multiple issues with multiple sectors to try and find solutions. The next generation sees this interdisciplinarity, and we need to put it all together because climate change is affecting both biodiversity loss and, and pollution issues. So Bill, I just want to have, invite you back into the scope of the environmental problems that we're facing. And the last one, by the way, in terms of pollution, many people are embracing this as environmental justice. And that is a relatively new term, but I just had my 50th anniversary, too, at a college in Washington, D.C., where Nancy Pelosi went, Trinity, and we raised three quarters of a million dollars for a program on environmental justice, because the next generation gets this confluence of social justice and environmental concern. So, Bill, the larger ecological crises that we're facing, give us your sense. Well, so there's no denying that we are in Serious trouble. I mean, and, and just to think, I was just looking up 1970, 1971 to try and give some sense. There are half as many wild animals on planet Earth as there were in 1970. Not species, number of animals. That's how much we've encroached on habitat, changed the climate, on and on and on. Um, that's a very large shift over a short period of time. And it has, as you say, all these things unite to produce extraordinary implications for justice. Let's keep the focus on places where we can leverage things. So let's talk about fossil fuels some more and for the moment lay aside the fact that it's destroying the climate, um, though that's a pretty large thing to lay aside. Let's look at the other thing that burning fossil fuel, which remember at this point is now a largely voluntary activity. We don't need to be doing it because we can use sun and wind and uh, other things to make electricity empower our lives. Nine million people a year, we now know from a big study finally published last year, nine million people a year on this planet die from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. Nine million turns out to be a lot. That's more than dive from COVID, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, war, and terrorism taken together last year. It's either the second or third leading cause of death on the planet. And again, we don't know how to solve cancer, but we know how to solve this. The solutions are electric bikes and solar power plants and you know on an, and 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 a magnetic induction cooktop in your kitchen and so on and so forth um these things hit the poorest people in the world far harder than they do anybody else in our country asthma rates are multiples higher for people of color for poor people because that's who gets to live next to highways and refineries and around the world all these things work in the same way. Just to give one quick example. Um, two years ago, we had the biggest hurricane season we've ever had in the Atlantic, which is precisely what we expect, because as we raise the temperature of the sea, hurricanes draw their power from the latent heat in the first few meters of the sea's surface. Well, um, the last two storms of the year didn't hit the US. They were in November. They hit 
uh, Central America. And by this point, we were well into the Greek alphabet, so this was Ada and Iota, 10 days apart. They decimated uh, Honduras and Guatemala. I don't, actually, decimated is not enough. That means a tenth. I mean, they, they, we think the damage to Honduras was equivalent to 40% of its GDP. By contrast, Hurricane Katrina, our worst storm ever, did damage equivalent to about 1% of GDP. So here's the reason to think about that. Nobody in Honduras did a damn thing to cause climate change. Their emissions are 1 20th in an average year what any of ours are. Uh, 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 I mean, they're a rounding error in the calculations. So if you're a farmer in Honduras and you can no longer farm because your farm is now covered with sand or because the bridge you need to take your produce to market was washed away and isn't going to be there for another decade, well, you might well end up heading north towards our southern border. And when you got there, I can't tell you what your legal status is going to be, because, uh, you know, but I can tell you what your moral status is. I mean, this is on us in all kinds of ways. Americans have produced a quarter of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, even though we're 4% of the world's population. And it's on us in generational terms, which we'll get to more in a minute, I think, anyway. But if you're if you're 60 right now, you've been on Earth to watch about 82% of all the emissions that the, we've, carbon, of, of carbon dioxide that humans have ever produced. So this is very much something that we need to be dealing with. Right. So I want to just mention the, some movements that are happening that are absolutely, um, I think, staggering in certain ways in terms of their import. So one is the youth movement in the UK, not only youth, but Extinction Rebellion has been driven in large part by the next generation. Sunrise movement here in the US, very much a youth movement. I find my students at Yale hugely passionate about the future and also feeling they can make a difference. And to release that creative energy of youth is clearly so important. They were very, very present in Glasgow in the COP meetings. The other group is the religious communities. And we all know religions have their problems. Um, but we've been working over 25 years to activate the moral force of religious communities. And I'll just say briefly before I turn over these two communities for, for Bill's commentary, um, you know, we're a 60s generation, right? I went to college in Washington, D.C. to be involved in civil rights, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and when Martin Luther King and others in the religious community, Abraham Heschel and others, marched in Selma, marched in DC. This was a moral force for change. Separate but equal was no longer a viable policy because the inequalities became to be more and more visible. So this moral, ethical, and spiritual force began to change the civil rights movement. Now we know we have a lot of work to do, but the hope here is, is both with youth and their energy and creativity and the religious communities. Um, and we've got a billion Muslims, we have a billion Hindus, we've got two billion Christians. I study the Asian traditions, there's a, a billion Confucians, and they are already, across the world, trying to identify environmental ethics from these different traditions. We have a huge website on this topic, religion and ecology, and Bill, got this from the very beginning and was one of the tremendous supporters because it was a very new idea. So again, I'm going to turn this over to Bill and just to highlight some positive movements, uh, religion, problems, and promise, youth, energy, impatience, and creativity, but lots of hope here, I think, in these two movements. Uh, absolutely. Um, and first of all, Mary Evelyn, extraordinary thanks to you and to John for I mean, really mobilizing those religious communities, helping them to see that their traditions contained uh, 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 enormous resources. And directly out of that work has come some of the most important uh, movement work around. If you, were, if you were asked to name the most important environmentalist in the world right now, one reasonable candidate is Pope Francis, whose um, encyclical Laudato Si', is an extraordinary 
critique of modernity, very much in the key of limits to growth or the kind of things that people were writing uh, back when in college, you know, um, but much updated and with a very powerful sort of set of moral reflections about where we are. And, and young people as well, you're absolutely right, have done extraordinary work, um, um, and not just college kids, I mean, really young kids. Everybody knows Greta Thunberg, and everybody should. She's great, one of my very favorite people to work with in the world. I truly adore her. But she would be the first to say, look, there's 10,000 Gretas around the planet. You have 10 million followers, and it's really powerful to see that. It's made life uh, extremely interesting, among other things, for college administrators um, over the last little while because kids have begun pushing hard for change. And this divestment activism became, which was modeled when we started it on the work that people had done places like this around apartheid uh, 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 in the, mostly in the 1980s, has turned into by far the biggest corporate campaigns in history. As you said, we're now at about $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios. Uh, that have, but it took extraordinary work from young people. Um, Harvard students went right to work in 2012 when we launched this campaign, and the Harvard administration went <laughs> right to work trying to beat them back immediately, published a long letter explaining why this would never happen and what a bad idea it was, and so on and so forth. And happily, the students and faculty and a lot of alumni just kept up the pressure year after year. It didn't hurt when uh, Oxford and Cambridge divested their portfolios. And uh, so I, I, I remember writing a piece saying, um, um, now that the two most uh, famous institutions in the English-speaking world have divested, maybe Harvard could come along too, you know, just because I know where the pressure points are located in Massachusetts Hall. But uh, so eventually last year, Harvard finally did uh, um, divest, which was, as predictable, a very good help and, and, and so on. But it took a ton of work. The good news is those kids came out of these places knowing how to do it. They're the ones who formed the Sunrise Movement that brought us the Green New Deal, which has kind of morphed into the Build Back Better Bill and you know whatever parts of that we can get through the Congress and things. So the young people are, are doing everything that they can, but, and maybe this is the point, we could talk about older people a little bit, do you think? Yes, just before that, if I could, yeah, that's the segue too. So there's youth, there's religious communities, there's us older folk. And I just wanted to highlight, um, footnote what you said about Laudato Si, mm. this encyclical from the Pope that came out in 2015. Now I like to say, uh, Bill came to Yale several years ago, we didn't come many times, but in that talk he said, Laudato Si, or was that breakfast the next morning, is the most important document of the 21st century. Now that's pretty amazing. It's from a, a phrase of old Italian meaning praise be. But I want to just underscore what happened in that document. Not only did he call on the science in the very first chapter, not only did he call on people from around the world, not just Catholics, not only did religious communities from around the world affirm this encyclical, but the most important thing is this. I teach at the School of the Environment at Yale, but also Divinity School. These two schools are silos. And so the School of the Environment hasn't fully embraced the human part, and only more recently, environmental justice. And the Divinity School, why a terrific school, has gone in the social justice, but not fully gotten the environment. With Laudato Si, eco-justice, environmental justice is coming together, and that's what youth are embracing, and people really get it. So it's a new moment. Now, <laughs> The great new moment, I think for all of us here, over 60, um, is what Bill has started up with, again, his ingenuity, creativity, tireless energy, uh, is called Third Act. There's a magnificent website for it, and I don't need to say all the parts of it exactly, but it includes climate change, it includes working with banks and divestment, and it includes voter rights and, and work ethics and so on. But it is fabulous. Uh, wonderful board of advisors, and Bill, take it away, third act. Well, just to, just to go back, I mean, look, 
one expects, um, in the end, uh, ministers and things to be on the, to start talking the right way about this. And one expects young people because our notion is that young people is where idealism resides and so on and so forth. And, and that's, you know, when I started 350.org, it was with seven college students at Middlebury, and then there's Greta, and you know, on and on and on, which is great. But it is not okay to take the biggest problems in the world and assign them to 17-year-olds to solve. Say, you know, in between Spanish homework and field hockey practice, could you also save the world for us, you know, um, is, is ignoble and also impractical. So we're trying to do this work to bring maybe the most crucial demographic on board, which is people over the age of 60. In this country, there are 70 million of us, which is more than the population of France. 10,000 people turn 60 every day in this country, which is more than the number of people who are born every day in this country, okay? Um, um, not only are there a lot of us, we all vote. Uh, uh, so we punch way, way above our weight politically. Not only that, we ended up with all the money. Fair or not, 70% 70 of the financial assets in America belong to baby boomers and the silent generation, compared with about 5% for millennials. So if you wanted to influence Washington or you wanted to influence Wall Street, you better get this crew on board. The theory has always been that people get more conservative as they age. They have more to hold on to or something. And there's a certain amount of statistical evidence for that, but we can't let it be true in this case, because if it is, we're not going to solve problems like climate change. We won't be able to break through in time. Um, and I don't think that it needs to be true for this generation. What we're finding as we start this third act thing and tens of thousands of people flood in to help is that there's a real and interesting generational DNA for people who are in this age group now. In our first act, we were around to either participate in or bear witness to truly transformative change. Uh, the most interesting period in American history and modern American history in a lot of ways. And, and, and bless us for it, you know. But taken as a whole with plenty of noble exceptions of whom I'm sure virtually everybody in this hall is a, could be counted on that list. Taken as a whole, it's just possible that our generations in their second act were a little more interested in consumerism than in citizenship, okay? Um, hence the way the world looks now, okay? Um, that's water under the bridge. In our third act, we have resources. We have skills developed over a lifetime. We've got time in many cases, which we didn't have before. And we've got kids or grandkids, so we have some reason to really focus on legacy. And legacy at the moment is not looking good. I mean, we're going to be the first generation that left the world in much shabbier condition than we found it, which is not what people want. So we're trying to pull people together to figure out how to utilize all those things into building a, a kind of complementary movement to the movement that young people have put together uh, on these issues. And it's going, it's going pretty well. I mean, our problem is we have tens and thousands of people flooding in wanting to help, and we don't have the infrastructure and resources quite to make full use of it, but we're getting there. And, and it's, it's very beautiful to watch because people bring not only um, all kinds of the skills and things, but also a certain kind of life experience that includes a little bit of um, a little bit of the humility that uh, you know life teaches you over time. I was just at a big demonstration uh, uh, outside these banks because the four big American banks, and we can talk about this, are the uh, single biggest funder of the fossil fuel industry in the world, uh, poured a trillion dollars in Chase, City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America since 
the Paris Climate Accords were signed. So the youth were demonstrating outside the big chase branch, and they asked uh, uh, us to come along and help, and we turned out a big crowd of older people because they were you know, somewhat spryer. The youth were marching at the front, but behind them in the end was this was good cavalcade of, of those of us marching under a large banner that just said, fossils against fossil fuels, okay? So <laughs> that is the spirit in which we are trying now hard to organize and, and to cause real and serious trouble for the powers that be. We need to push the institutions over which we have some leverage from big banks to places like Harvard to wherever it is to act with way more focus and dispatch than they have been acting to date. We need this to be true focus here that really gets things done. Yeah, and we're gonna take your questions very soon, but just as a final question, and your book will be the final, final, um, but after questions. You know, our teacher Thomas Berry said years ago, we've got to have systemic change, institutional change, and of course, personal change. Um, so it's not just changing your light bulbs, it's changing institutions too. And clearly, a class like this, a university like this, has immense capacity in every possible way. Um, you've got Chuck Schumer, my college had Nancy Pelosi. But you have resources and ideas that I think are extraordinary, and that's why third act is so important. But I just want to say in this sense that if we can put together, even in the, the systemic side, institution side, I like to say peer, so it's the political, it's the educational, it's the economic, and the religious world. These are four institutions that are changing. As we were talking before, it takes a long time. We've identified a few things in the religious sphere. You know in the educational sphere, Harvard's got a great environmental studies program. We were working with it when we had our conferences here. And so Stanford's just started its School of the Environment. Columbia, where I did my graduate studies, is, has a new school for climate change. So all the universities are moving forward in this direction. The political sphere, we can all comment on in our own ways, but I want to highlight, since we haven't, and I know some of you are probably scratching your heads, the economic sphere is moving forward. My father was a corporate lawyer at Davis Polk in New York, and he understood these problems. He was totally thinking for the next generation. My brother is head of Chubb Insurance in New York for his whole career, and he is so concerned about insurance is going to lose their hats and shirts, and, and Swiss Re knows this, Munich Re knows this, it's up on their websites. We need to bring this into visibility. Department of Defense has been saying this is a national security issue, climate change, for a long, long time. But the financial community is getting the risk for our economy and the world economy. I just want to put that in. It might come up in some questions. So let's make sure we get some questions. And while we're getting them, do you want to make any comment about the economic sphere? Just to say, um, our first instinct when we think about these things is often to think about what we should do personally in our own lives. That's fine. I'm happy I've got solar panels all over my roof and that they connect to my electric car and blah, blah, blah. But I don't try to fool myself that that's how we're going to solve this at this point. We've waited too long to do the climate math one Tesla at a time. Um, um, the most important thing an individual can do is be less of an individual and join together with others in movements large enough to make actual shifts happen. So that's the, that's the hope. That's how, why we organize the way that we do. And, and it, there's no guarantees that it'll work, just to guarantee it won't work unless we do that, I think. Okay, while we're waiting for questions, Bill has a fabulous new book out, The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. Commenting on, if I might. The, the subtitle's better, actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> says, a graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. Okay. Well, and, and this is what I was just gonna say quickly, and then back to you. All the values that many of us grew up with, Bill is questioning, and they are changing. That's what we're trying to put forward here this afternoon, that they are changing. 
I grew, I grew up in Lexington, down, uh, down Mass Ave, about 10 miles. So, I, and I spent my uh, summers giving uh, uh, tours of Lexington Green for the visitors who come wearing my tricorn hat. So I came by my patriotism honestly and so on and so forth. And I think that I thought in those days that this, was, that this modest paradise that was American suburbia would just keep extending out. And, we, uh, and that's not what happened. Somehow we ended up in a country that's marked by radical divisions in ways we couldn't have imagined. Then it would not have occurred even at the height of things going on in the 60s or the height of Watergate that people would be storming the Capitol with clubs to stop people from counting votes. Uh, 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 that the progress we'd made on race would begin to backslide at an alarming rate, so on and so forth. So trying to figure out how that happened became the project for this book. But it really was, in certain ways, the, the genesis of this work that we're doing at Third Act, um, trying to recapture some of that early spirit. And I will say one very good thing is that uh, uh, not only are many of us still alive, which is very good. Um, but many of the kind of cultural icons of that moment are still alive and still eager to help and put pitch in. It's been great fun. Uh, uh, say, I, I t say often when I'm talking to young people, say what you want about OK Boomer and so on. We did have the best music of all time. <laughs> and and, and it, so it's been a real pleasure to be, you know, getting to work pretty closely with Carol King and Bette Midler and, and Patti Smith and Neil Young and all sorts of people in building out this work. And it, that's just that kind of, kind of spirit, too, that we need to capture again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I can see uh, lots of questions that we'll make sure get to Bill and to us, even if we can't answer all of them. Okay. What advantage is an electric car when most electricity is produced by fossil fuels? First of all, first of all, your electric car, your electric motor is so much more efficient than the internal combustion engine that even if you hooked it to the dirtiest coal-fired power plant in the world, it would still be producing considerably fewer carbon emissions than it is burning gas. Second of all, once you've put everything on electricity, the hope is that, and increasing the reality is, that we, that we can then clean that up by producing clean electricity. As I say, everybody here can already do it if they're willing to spend the money to put solar panels on the roof and things. But what we obviously need to do is quickly build out that capacity for solar power, wind power, and things just for this reason, so we can electrify stuff. That's why the Build Back Better bill that's sitting in the Senate has three or four hundred billion dollars in tax credits to jumpstart precisely that kind of work. That's why the president today was using the Defense Production Act around solar energy and heat pumps and things. So don't be deterred. The, the sort of if you do want to work on your own house, once you've done some good work to help in the larger sense, the trinity of uh, the trinity of appliances that really make sense are some kind of electric vehicle, if you need a car, a car, a bike, if you can get by with that, um, the induction heat top for your kitchen, and the air source heat pump to replace the furnace and the air conditioner. Um, these are all affordable, and they're all more elegant than the thing they replace. So I'll just say, if, you know, if you really, if you like cars, um, um, even if you really like going fast in cars for some reason. The EV is a huge improvement in every way over what you're used to driving. So, just saying. Okay, so I'm gonna give you these in sort of rapid fire. Yes, you can. Because um, they're mostly dealing with technology, I want to observe, which is great, but it's also a mindset that we might need to yes. enlarge. I just wanna put that footnote there. But I just wanna follow with this one, how fast do you think we can realistically shift from fossil fuel cars and power generation to mainly renewables? And what steps do you think are realistic? What timetable do you envision? So it's an hour long question. So, yeah, let's just, let's do it in two ways. One is just to note that the f focus on the word realistic, okay? 
So let's think about what realism in this case dictates. There indefinitely is a political and economic realism that makes it hard to do things fast and so on and so forth. Sadly, because change is always easier if it goes slowly, sadly, that political realism is trumped in this case by reality realism, okay? Just remember that unlike other political debates, what's going on with climate change is not the same. It's not a fight in the end between two groups of human beings, though it has that aspect sometimes. The real fight is not Republicans versus Democrats, industry versus environmentalists. The real fight is human beings versus physics. And that is a difficult fight to win because physics is highly immature, doesn't negotiate or compromise, it can't use its words, it just does what it's going to do, okay? And our job is to respect that. So, in that case, the good news is that if we wanted to move with everything we had, it is within our capacity to meet the limits it imposes. Mark Jacobson at Stanford, his lab is probably the controlling authority here. They've put out plans for all 50 states and every major country on Earth now, demonstrating how they could be running entirely on wind, sun, and hydropower by 2035 at prices that are commensurate with which we're paying now. A huge study from Oxford last year found that the quick transition to renewable energy would save us on the order of $20 trillion over the next couple of decades. If that sounds impossible, just think about, yes, it's going to take money to put up a lot of solar panels and wind turbines. But once they're up, okay, the sun delivers the energy every day when it rises above the horizon. That's why Exxon hates it so much, because their business model is you write them a new check every day for another load of stuff, and then you burn it, and someone has to go mine it again. And 40% of the ships on the sea are carrying nothing but fossil fuel back and forth to be burned and consumed. At the moment, we call that realistic, but in fact, it's not smart economically, and it's suicidal in environmental terms. So we've got a lot of work to do very fast. It's not going to be easy, it has to be done. Quick answer, big question. The prospects for hydrogen power. Hydrogen power is gonna be the last thing we burn on the planet, and it's a good storage mechanism for energy if we use the sun and wind to produce it. The fossil fuel industry would like to use natural gas to make hydrogen, that is not helpful. And so it's good to see that there's a few places around the world where so-called green hydrogen is, is going to be produced. That's what we should be using for long-haul jet flights and for making steel, which are going to be two of the hardest things to figure out how to do without fossil fuel. Okay, should um, the government buy fossil fuel companies to neutralize them? Uh, well, it, it, this, would be, this would have been a good plan, especially six months ago before their value went up again for a while. Um, um, I, personally, yes, I mean, you can make the argument that they should, or we could nationalize them, whatever, or you could make the argument that the time has come for a deal, and the deal is we won't send you to jail for having lied about climate change for 30 years if you'll start doing the right thing. I don't know. I, this is why I'm... <clears throat> This is, why I'm a, this is why I don't go actually go into actual politics. I stay on the outside because I'm not, uh, you wouldn't want me cutting the deal. But. And our mutual friend, Gus Beth, who was the dean of our School of the Environment at Yale and also founded NRDC and World Research Institute, headed up the UN Development Program, wrote a book that MIT published last year called They Knew, which is 50 Years of Government Complicity in subsidizing fossil fuels and knowing the consequences for health, for the planet, et cetera. They knew, Gus Beth. Um, I want to also, because there's a lot of technical questions, as I say, and <laughs> my, my feeling is we have the technology and sorting out the priorities of that, um, but it's also the values. And so some of the questions are coming up now on what value changes will transform us. What mindsets, what paradigm shifts. I love it, the women are nodding. The value changes are crucial. Absolutely. The technology is always the easy part. Humans are good at 
we're, we're the beaver part of us is excellent. You know, we're good at working hard to develop new things and engineer them and work on them and stuff. The part that we're always bad at is deciding not to do something that we're capable of doing or that we're doing now. It becomes extraordinary. I mean, if you watch, say, political systems in action, it's almost always easier to get politicians to fund some new thing than it is to get them to stop something that's going on at the moment. And the reason is that there's a constituency behind that and, and, and so pressure to keep it going and things. And that's what's difficult. That's why these become such difficult transitions. And we do have to make sure that people who spent their lives mining coal aren't just tossed aside. It's not their fault that they're good at doing something that we no longer can do on this planet. And we have plenty of money to make it possible to, I mean, literally there are fewer people now mining coal in America than there are working at Arby's roast beef sandwich shops. It is not past our ability to make sure that they have a dignified retirement if they're too old to learn something new. We have to do it, and those shifts are, are hard. We've got other technologies that are coming. You know, We may get a next generation of nuclear power at some point that's actually cheap and you know, cheap enough to use and so on. But the technology's never the, the, the real problem here. The problem is always that inertia and vested interest that makes it so hard to shift when we need to. And that's why we've been working with the world religions on these value changes. Uh, we can name them, some of you are calling for what are lifestyle changes and so on. This is hugely hard and it's gonna be hard for the US. But if you look at Europe, they don't live at the standard of living that we think somehow we deserve. Uh, the McMansions, the consumption, this is going to be hard. This is really going to be hard. But that's part of it this. Would be, it, would be just, it would be terrible to have to go live like you know, a Norwegian or right. a, a Frenchman or something for right. a while. That, you know, um, it would be brutal. Yeah. No. We could join hands across the ocean. Um, OK, and this also relates. Is there any serious discussion of uh, population control in an attempt to slow the sixth extinction? Well, so this is such an yes. interesting question um, because when y'all were in college, it was seen as the central question. Paul Ehrlich published the population bomb in 1968, 1969, so while you're in college. And, and so this is a place where humans have done a real job of dealing with things. Um, alerted to a problem, people went to work. A few of them were in this country, you know, various philanthropists and stuff, but almost all the important work's been done in the developing world where population was growing fast. And what did people find was the key to this? The key turned out to be educating women and empowering women to one degree or another. So, <laughs> when you were... When you were in college, the average woman had six children on this planet. Um, it turns out that given a choice, most women didn't want to have six children. The number of children now is about 2.3 and continuing to fall, and that's if you exclude China's one. So the population is going up some, um, and we're, you know, we're going to top out with another billion or two in the course of this century sometime the next 40 years, that's not gonna be easy and it causes a lot of the other problems that Mary Evelyn was talking about, but when it comes to things like climate change, that's not what's driving things at this point. Almost all that population growth is coming in places that use very little energy. And we forget sometimes just how big, when we're talking about abstractions like environmental justice, think about it in terms of numbers. The average American family uses more energy between the stroke of midnight and New Year's Eve and dinner on January 2nd than the average Tanzanian family uses in a year, okay? So the number of Tanzanians is, is, not, a, is not going to cause, make or break climate change. Our problem's figuring out how we break that curve of rising consumption in somewhat the same way that we broke the curve of rising fertility. We don't know quite what the equivalent of women's education and empowerment is here. That's what we're 
you know, working hard to do. My husband and I don't have children. It wasn't exactly a full choice, but I feel in some ways we wouldn't have been able to do this work. I feel we give an intergenerational handshake to our students who we love dearly. When they're away from you, they're with us. Um, but more women are making those kinds of choices too. There are so many ways to nurture in this world, be it male or female, and encouraging nurturing. And I do want to say so that we don't have to feel badly for our lifestyles and our consumption. Americans are some of the most generous on the planet. There's no philanthropy that I think compares, not in Europe, not even in Asia. Asia, where I studied, they're just learning what philanthropy is about. So the generosity of Americans, both in terms of understanding their, their implications for the rest of the world and financial resources for Third Act and for things that are on the horizon are, I think, one of our great resources. Now, another big question. Could you list specific policy changes in the U.S. that could make a difference in this climate emergency? Look, the, the, these are not uh, obscure things. The first version of Biden's uh, Build Back Better bill had what was called the Clean Energy Pricing Plan, which would have forced utilities to ratchet up each year their um, um, purchase of renewable uh, uh, energy. That was a very good idea, and Joe Manchin stripped it out last November. So that's something we could quickly go back to. Second good idea is in the current one. It's not as good. It's, all, it's no stick, all carrot. It's just hundreds of billions of dollars in tax credits for doing smart things. That, so far, Joe Manchin et al. have blocked, but I'm afraid that if they give in, it'll be because they've managed to make it so that most, a lot of that money is going for fossil fuel instead of renewable energy. The thing as it exists right now is a good idea. So these are not like obscure, out of left field things that no one's thought of. We've basically known what to do for 35 years about climate change and there's never been, in, in fact, we've known longer than that. When Jimmy Carter was, this was one of the things I found out about writing this book. When Jimmy Carter was running for president in 1980, he proposed in his budget enough money that the U.S. would be producing 20% of its energy from solar power by the year 2000. And there was no technological obstacle to doing that. There was just an ideological one, which is why Ronald Reagan took down Jimmy Carter's solar panels right after he got into the White House. That's the world that we've been living in, and that's the world we've got to get out of, and it's not a question of you know, people knowing what policies are, it's a question of making sure that we get enough power to do them. Uh, on even numbered years, part of that work is electoral. Far be it from me to say anything, but your classmate, Mr. Schumer, would be better off if he had a couple more people uh, uh, in his caucus uh, to push for this kind of thing so that people like Mr. Manchin weren't quite so powerful. Wind, wind up here, um, and I know that Chuck Schumer said earlier, uh, we can't give up, we have to keep working because we don't know what will actually happen. And I do think this is an energy transformation, isn't it? It's why a lot of the questions came up as technology, clearly. But it's a human energy transition too. Do we have the human energy and capacity? Of course we do. We did this in World War II. We had tremendous sacrifice, victory gardens, et cetera. So it's a human energy issue that we can encourage one another to make this great transition from fossil fuels to renewable, but also a renewal of the human spirit. And I think that's what Bill McKibben has done tirelessly across this country since 1989 and before. Let's give it up for Bill McKibben. Thank you. Uh, and let's give it up for Mary Evelyn Tucker as well. Thank you.